last week on The Slut Show. What the fuck is radical about wanting to be treated fucking equal? That's not radical. So, fuck me. When did you learn about feminism? You are the only one that you have to deal with your whole fucking life. So you better you better start being friends with yourself. Better fall in love with yourself because you're the only one there. Yeah, right exactly. now we think that fat is unhealthy, which is not the case. Look at fucking Lizzo. She can dance and sing and twerk and play the flute for two hours straight. And you're going to tell me that she's unhealthy? You're like, going to tell me that I'm healthier than Lizzo is? Like, Don't fucking <laughs> think like, so, that honey. That's so stupid. Yeah. I, I walk up one pair of stairs. I'm out of breath. I'm like, shit. I'm gonna have a heart attack. What the <laughs> fuck are you same. talking about? I'm healthy. Exactly. I'm skinny, yeah. not healthy. That's not the same. Exactly. So you're not narcissistic for liking yourself. Give us the same rights you have, and you will same, still have the same rights. Exactly. You yeah. will just not have the privilege over us, and that's something exactly. you're refusing to give up. I do have a lot of sluts around me, so that's nice. <laughs> hey, uh, give it up for the <laughs> sluts in town! Slut show! And as soon as we start like realizing, shit, sex is fun. That was such an eye opener for me. <laughs> yeah. This week on The Slut Show. How are you as a man in, in this patriarchal world learning to deal with your emotions? How are you, are you learning to express them? Uh, therapy. Rights are not like a piece of pie. It's not like I take a piece of pie and there's less for the rest. Uh -huh. No, rights are unlimited. If you give women the same rights that are given to men right now, that doesn't take any rights from them away. I can't just say, hey, I'm a feminist, so I'm one of the good guys. No, you need to work your ass off. If an eight-year-old faces racism, then white kids are sure as hell not too young to learn about it when their peers are facing it. Don't come at me saying that you couldn't find someone. Fuck off. No, we don't want a dialogue about oppression. Oppression is wrong, yeah. and we need to get rid of that shit. You cannot run away from yourself and your thoughts and your past. Exactly. Deconstructing your manhood, that definitely uh, is um, something I try to do every day, and it's painful. It's, it's uh, confronting, especially. Are you ready? Yes. Awesome. Okay, three, two, one. Hey you, thank you so much for listening. No matter when you are listening, no matter where you are, get comfortable. Get yourself a cup of tea, a glass, or an entire bottle of wine. Maybe smoke a blunt, get under a blanket, grab yourself some popcorn, and enjoy this week's episode of The Slut Show with Ellen Moore. Ladies, gentlemen, non-binary beans, and any and everyone in between, my name is Ellen Moore, and welcome to this fourth episode of the fourth season. In the studio with me today is a Dutch political party member from Bijeen. He is a social justice warrior, Black Lives Matter activist, and self-proclaimed feminist. I'm talking about the one and only Daryl. Yeah. <laughs> How are you? Well, thanks for having me in the first place. Um, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm so excited Happy to, to have here. you on the, on the show. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, I'm not, not nervous, but I'm a bit curious about right. how things are going to develop. Uh, it's good to be here. Yeah, I'm yeah. really uh, happy to, for the first time on the Slut Show ever, have a cisgender man. Oh, wow. You're the first one. <laughs> Yikes. Okay, yeah. Well. The, the very first, so that is actually, uh, you know, Slut Show history, I guess. Um, how have you been lately? Tired, mostly. Well, you actually, you've been introducing me as a social justice warrior, and there's right. always something to do. Yeah. And I can literally exaggerate a bit. <laughs> which means you often get tired and need your rest. So right. I'm a bit tired, honestly, yeah. Recharging is really important. We're gonna get into that later on mm -hmm. as well. Um, we're gonna talk about how men can contribute to feminism, all the things that you feel passionate about, um, mm -hmm. how even men also too uh, benefit from breaking down the patriarchy. Definitely. But before we're gonna get into all the goods, the Slut Show with Ellen Moore, the podcast slash talk show about shit you and I have to deal with on a daily basis. About feminism, insecurities, feeling like a bomb ass bitch, and obviously about loads of sex. Enjoy your weekly dose of empowerment. What is the most empowering thing you did lately? Well, I think discussing intergenerational trauma with my mom. Wow. And, uh, yeah, yeah. I reach out to my mom a lot when I'm not feeling okay or when I'm not happy or whatever. But for some reason, we are still talking and actually hurting and healing when it comes to our history. Mm -hmm. So that was really powerful but, uh, because I do think I do understand her more, even more better and clearer now right. as we speak. Yeah. Of course, you've grown up, you've grown into yourself. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine that age changing can make a huge change definitely yeah so uh, i thought i knew my mother pretty well but because of our convos i actually know myself a bit better as well which is uh, good for you a big gain yeah definitely yeah that Thanks. is super important you're so welcome that is it's so important to constantly reflect on yourself your own behavior and take a look in the mirror it's hard but it's it's hard it's yeah. the work we need to do i think 
we are uh, going to get all into that, but there's no slut show without slutty science, so... I got some slutty science for you because we like to stick to facts. Slutty science with more. The structure of gender inequality rooted in the patriarchal world we live in has been associated with a culture of violence against women. The educational and occupational status of women in countries has been shown to be correlated to the prevalence of sexual violence in a country, with a higher status of women corresponding with lower rates of sexual violence. Physical violence against women is more likely to occur than physical violence against men. The lack of representation of women in legal and criminal justice systems contributes to a society in which men can use physical violence against women without fear or punishment. When I give you a gun and there are six spaces to put bullets, but I only put in one bullet, I twist whatever holds the bullet and I tell you, put the gun on your head and shoot. You wouldn't do it, right? Even though it's only a chance of one in six. But you wouldn't do it because the chance of... The bullet hitting right in your head is one in six. Similarly, women are aware that not all men are shit, but not every woman needs to be a victim of violence for violence to do control the lives of women. If a climate develops in which women know that sexual violence occurs, a woman does not need to have personal experience with it in order to feel fearful. As a matter of fact, that is a standard terrorist strategy. Violence against some creates terror, resulting in limited behavior of many. A culture of violence against women, which has been linked to the structures of male dominance like we know them from the patriarchy, grows a culture of fear amongst women. Let's dive into statistics. The prevalence estimates of lifetime intimate partner violence range from 20% in the Western Pacific, 22% in high-income countries like Europe, 25% in America, 33% in the African region, 31% in the Eastern Mediterranean region, and 33% in the Southeast Asia region. Femicide is a difficult word for a woman being murdered. Homicide is a difficult word for a man being murdered. Globally, around 38% of all femicides are committed by intimate partners whereas only 5% of all homicides are committed by intimate partners. Apart from the violence women faced, there are many, many more statistics which illustrates the inequality ingrained in our society like we discussed in the study science from episode 2. One of the areas of society in which inequality plays a massive role is women's reproductive rights. Why are men deciding what women are and are not allowed to do with their bodies? I mean, no uterus, no opinion. When looking at the facts, birth control is given to the wrong gender. One man can impregnate nine women every single day for nine months. And that adds up to 2,430 pregnancies. Yes, I'm aware that it's very unlikely for a man to impregnate nine women every single day, but even in the case that he impregnates one woman every day for nine months, that is still 270 kids. One woman, however, can only birth one child in that same period of time. Man milk is anywhere between 270 and 2,430 times more dangerous than uterus. So when are we going to stop shooting at a bulletproof vest instead of unloading the goddamn gun? That's a good question. <laughs> that is a real good question. Yeah. And some painful facts you're actually putting out there. Yeah, for sure. I, I'm very happy to have an ally in the studio, someone who calls himself a feminist and is very outspoken about it. Um, how did you get into feminism? Domestic violence, basically. Well, yeah. Well, you mentioned in the beginning you said I'm a self-proclaimed feminist I used to say that indeed and don't get me wrong I love feminism I need feminism in order to heal in order to understand this world in terms of equality but I do think as a man you need to earn that title of a feminist I can't just say hey I'm a feminist so I'm one of the good guys no you need to work your ass off right. at least that would be 
my opinion about that. Hey you, we have a new trigger warning system. If you hear this sound, a potential trigger will follow. The first one will follow right after this interruption. If you want to see what triggers we are warning you for, check out the podcast description or check out the right top corner of the YouTube video to see the blinking warning lights with the potential trigger. Enjoy the rest of the episode. Feminism started basically when I literally saw my mom got beaten up by my father domestic, domestically and mm -hmm. I'm a victim of domestic violence as well. Right. emotionally and physically and for some reason yeah of course you're growing up as a kid as a youngster and people always used to tell me like well women are this and that and they actually they're exaggerating they're always complaining for more rights and all that kind of shit and I was like well maybe they do but my mother is my like my example and she mm -hmm. is not one of those women actually claiming no she's getting beaten up and she's hurt and she's traumatized so I don't care what people say right. if my mom is my example she doesn't fit into that narrative that women are actually well doing well and they don't need extra rights in order to prevail that is bullshit so that was my main cue for not necessarily directly understand what feminism is but knowing that there are other perspectives which are, are not heard right. as we speak so that embodies my mom so that's where it started Totally. I think that what some people tend to forget is that rights are not like a piece of pie. It's not like I take a piece of pie and there's less for the rest. Uh -huh. No, rights are unlimited. If you give women the same rights that are given to men right now, that doesn't take any rights from them away. It just makes us function as equals. Yeah. And I think that was a very eye-opening, uh, you know, reference to me thinking of it as pie rights are like pie you know there's plenty for everyone mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i reckon a lot of men including are yeah afraid of giving up privileges it's basically privilege and power in in terms of who's able to say something or not so yes we are afraid as a male culture definitely yeah, yeah. and in a very similar way it works with white privilege because obviously, obviously um white people are still not ready to give up their privilege either mm -hmm. otherwise racism would not be a thing right now no um you are a huge activist in all kinds of social unjust situations basically how did you end up with uh, the political party by aim let's start with that well yeah yeah that's a funny story in that sense because i was tired of doing nothing basically and yeah i started going to demonstration without telling anyone because i was too fearful in the sense that people would judge me wrong or would say something about well why are you doing that we're going to tell the police whatever so right. I went to multiple demonstration tours of housing, finances, but also the climate change and almost racism as well. And I just, yeah, I noticed the same people at the same or the different sites right. of, of demonstrations. So I was like, who are these people? And then I found out and they said something very prolific, like oppression is like our common language and where oppression occurs there we need to fight and resist and yeah. those people were actually not the founders but the first people who got engaged with article 8 so formerly mm -hmm. known and now it's called by so mm -hmm. those people were my references and right when they started to form an organization a movement yeah i was like well i need to be part of this because they speak my the same language yeah and they're not necessarily the same they're not all black people but mm -hmm. then again they are here to fight against racism or misogyny right. or whatever so that's where it started they're all people who uh fit to a they're all outcasts basically and yeah yeah most of us are traumatized we know what oppression is what trauma means what injustice means so we're tired of that shit. and that's why we try to combine all our struggles intersectionally which is hard but then again it's it's the only way out i guess yeah, yeah. i totally agree with you i know that um i don't know enough about by a but what I do know is that I definitely voted for them um, yeah. because <laughs> totally uh, I feel like it's very important to also, you know, uh, use my platform to say wh what I voted for and whatever other people de decide to do is on them. But mm -hmm. I will be more than happy to, you know, <laughs> introduce them to my aim. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, well, definitely. And we like to emphasize things when we yeah. talk about, for instance, the Tuslagen affair. That's a that's a sign or an example of institutional racism. This country is not ready yet to actually mm -hmm. Emphasize the words and which they mean and how they operate and actually inflict damage on groups of people and that's and, what I like by and to face the real the, the real issues that are going on right now yeah, yeah. 
Um, I think that um, this party started by uh, Silvana Simons, and I think that m might be important for people who are not from the Netherlands and don't follow Dutch politics uh, to also, you know, explain a little bit what what the Tuschlagaffaire in general even is. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's basically really s roughly summarized a um, tax scandal that occurred because of systemic racism yeah. in the tax systems that function in the Netherlands. Um, and crazily enough, uh, our prime minister is still our prime minister, even though he was a huge part of that, um, well, <laughs> thing happening. Yeah, scandal or whatever. You know? Yeah, whatever yeah. he likes to call it. Um, and that is all the more, well, uh, facts and, and demonstration of how um, systemic racism occurs in every single area of our society. Yeah, in this context, women were targeted most, were hurt the most. Single moms, uh, w women of color were mm -hmm. hit the most because of this racist tactic. And this shows, all <clears throat> this also shows that women basically, they end up, let's just say they benefit the least of every situation, socioeconomically, politically, culturally, and we right. need to fucking address that. Yeah, as absolutely. As much as we can, yeah. You um, began speaking, when did you begin speaking at Black Lives Matter demonstrations, events? Not that long ago, actually. I would say maybe four or five years ago, and I don't mind talking to groups of people, but then again, it was something else actually facing your own fears as a kid. I've been racist, I've been targeted targeted in terms of racism when I was eight years old. That's where it started. And I'm still traumatized because of that by yeah. the police. So it's actually a big deal breaker for me to talk and to speak up against institutional racism, against the police, against media, against politicians whatsoever. But I would say four or five years ago, it really started hitting off, uh, yeah. Right, yeah. and how did you when did you when you first got asked what did you want to say well i wanted to express my anger like why is nobody hearing us like what is the what do we need to do even more in order to prove that we are human beings like we're murdered for nothing or racially profiled for nothing especially black women are treated like you know second or third rate citizens and yeah i was just tired i wanted to express my anger but then again you need some charisma or maybe a narrative in order to drag the people to soak them and to engage them in your story right. so that's what I try to do and yeah, normally it helps but afterwards I need my call it self care or whatever I need my people in order to treat me or to give me something in order to cool off right. because m mostly I am afterwards I'm very angry and pissed and yeah emotionally well yeah it drains drain thank you yeah you're you're constantly on you're constantly fighting you're constantly having the hard conversations you're constantly teaching people trying to educate them no. and that costs so much that costs yeah. so and much we underestimate that that phase of self-care absolutely terribly yeah, yeah, yeah. right yeah. what ha what has your personal uh process been in regards to self-care yeah, like I said, I, I talked a lot, a lot to my mom about this, about mental health especially. Mm -hmm. But in terms of deconstructing your manhood, that definitely um, is um, something I try to do every day. And it's painful. It's, it's uh, confronting especially. And what it, it does help realizing what position I could get or currently I am like filling in in this society as a man. And right. it's, it's very problematic and it's actually scary in my case, I would say. It's really scary. Sex therapy with Sarah. The social construct of masculinity poses as a major barrier to mental health treatment for men. As men are socialized to present as strong and stoic, the idea of benefiting from mental health support can feel shameful and even opposing to one's own masculinity. This perceived lack of access to mental health services makes men much more susceptible to substance abuse and suicide. You said that from your, like when you were eight years old on, you encountered racism. Well, yeah. if an eight year old faces racism, then white kids are sure as hell not uh, too young to learn about it when their peers are facing it. Exactly. And in a similar way, um, deconstructing your manhood uh, in, in a way of, well, it's, it's a way of deconstructing the patriarchy and trying to see how the systems really function. Yeah. In a similar way, I feel like it's so important for men to do that and for men to critically look at themselves and the privileges they have when women are... This morning, I literally got a dick pic sent over again 
And I just, I got, like Manon is sitting me at the camera. She's a production assistant who, thank you for being here, for existing, for everything. I can't even. <laughs> um, and I just got so enraged. I just couldn't handle it. I was so fucking furious because um, when it comes to feminism and women not being treated equally, there is nothing you can do to a dick pic send over. If I expose them, then I am sharing nudity and I will get taken down. If mm. I tag Instagram, no matter what I say, they're going to be able to find it back even if I delete the stories. If I call them out, I'm sharing personal images, but then I can't go to the police, even though the police do stuff with online harassment when it comes to their colleagues. When it's convenient for them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, the okay. shits, it's one big shit show and that's why the yeah. show's here. I'm so sorry to hear, by the way. Because I can't even relate to that kind of stuff. But then again, I am part of this culture as well. As right. Man, but right? you are fighting so hard to um, be our ally, mm. to um, amplify the voice that we try to have. Uh, we LGBTQ people, yeah. we uh, women, um, non-cis or cis, whatever. Um, what is something that... Because I feel I really, really, really feel like it's so important to contribute to breaking down systemic racism that is mm -hmm. so important to me and ever since the conversations began uh after the murder uh of george floyd mm -hmm. i think that was a, a game-changing moment for a lot of people especially white people yeah. who then realized wait this isn't the first time this has been happening for so many fucking decades what can what is the um first step you think uh white people need to make in order to make it a safer world also for black people and people of color yeah well that's a good question then again i don't have all the answers but what would help is well basically what you are doing speaking out if if people have a lot of privileges based on their race or whatever network socioeconomical status use those platforms and spaces in order to yeah amplify black voices or voices of people of color that would help and then again resist a lot demonstrations whatever do something in your daily life which regards resistance you know when it comes to white people in general in the culture resistance is more like saying yeah we're gonna talk about it we're gonna have a dialogue about racism or about sexism or about the patriarch no we don't want a dialogue about oppression oppression is wrong yeah. and we need to get rid of that shit so my first answer would be like well, yeah, give up your privileges by making room for others, the less heard voices, racially speaking, in this context. But right. yeah, that would be it. And there's lots more you can do by quitting your job when you're CEO, whatever, to give more people places of power in which they can operate as a people of color or black right. people. Yeah. Right. And also, if you have your own business, um, you are the only one who decides who's going to work for you. So yeah. actively seek people who are of color, who are uh, uh, LGBTQIA+, who are disabled. Actively create a team around you of people who um, all contribute to giving a proper... Um, what the fuck is Dorshne? <laughs> Average? Average of what society is like. Mm -hmm. I'm going to leave that bit in. Um, <laughs> it's, so imp it's so important. Yeah, it, it, is, it is important. And normally, a lot of organizations would say when, not even only white people, but yeah, obviously, mostly, they would tell, like, yeah, we couldn't find anyone. And that's because usually... Fuck in, you, in you their, didn't search hard enough. Exactly. In your train of thought, in the way you're thinking, it's probably white dominant. You're going to look for the people who actually resemble your culture or your manifestation of what works or not. Mm -hmm. And we need to transcend that and very quickly. And usually they don't, they don't do that by themselves because it works. The privilege works. It feeds the unknown or the unaware part of doing something for someone else. Absolutely. Why would you do something for someone else? Because you're good as it gets, right? Or to me, I mean, I mean, like your, well, your life is flowing. Like, why would you give a fuck about someone else? Don't come at me saying that you couldn't find someone. Fuck off. Hmm. Actively search for them. Just... Yeah, or seek help. Try yes. to uh, try to inform people like, hey, I'm trying to make this space inclusive. Yes. Or whatsoever, but I need help in order to do that. Yeah. I'm, I'm constantly speaking to black friends of mine, uh, people of color, uh, people who are very inclusive, who uh, can recommend me other people to, you know, get more 
people of color on the show. I literally, for this season, I, mm. for these two seasons, I deliberately, I made spaces in my like uh, recordings. Uh, I, I knew that I at least wanted three people of color per season because mm. it doesn't resemble an actual society. If it's no. not like that, you need to make room for those voices. And I don't want this to be, oh, look at you doing good. No, not at all. It's, that's normal. It's the bare fucking minimum. Yeah. It's not, oh, mm. good for you. It's where we need to start. And we need to do so much more. Here. What are books that you would recommend to people? Like, read that if you want to confront your own white privilege or systemic racism. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I would definitely recommend Witte Onschuld. So, White, right. white Innocence from Gloria Wecker, which is very confronting, I guess, for white people. But including even, like, Everyday Racism, Dutch Racism from Philomena Essay. Mm -hmm. Those are books, actually who gave not only meaning to my life, but it was more like clarifying things I could feel on a daily, but never could, you know. Pinpoint. Like, yeah, or, or even describe like what is happening. Why do I feel that way if I see these images? Or when I walk into a store buying some shit and people looking at me like you don't belong here. What is that? Where is it from? So these books are actually examples of deconstructing and describing that those processes right and yeah it would it would definitely i guess would lecture you in a different way in a counterclockwise way of what white culture or white supremacy is yeah absolutely watch documentaries read books i'm yeah. currently reading why i'm no longer talking to white people about mm, racism yeah. read that one too very yeah. important book i feel like it's very relevant for everyone but especially white people do your fucking homework yeah. you have not been Th going through systemic racism your entire life so and other people have so go fucking read about it um <laughs> that being said yeah. um obviously activism plays a huge role in your life if not the leading the leading role yeah uh taking rests can be hard um what do you do to balance it well frankly to be honest it is it's not in balance right now and yes, like you were saying, it's um, it's not a side job or whatsoever. I don't expect to get paid. Mm -hmm. I just want to live deliberately with my people, yeah, me, in equal, you know, in in an equal way of living. But in order to balance, I need to rest. That's basically it. I need to accept that you can't uh, save the whole world throughout the day right. or by just continuing your your actions and stuff no you need your rest yeah and we both know i guess resting is actually a revolutionary act in the sense Absolutely. of battling capitalism because we are actually you know programmed or steered to do the most every day like Absolutely. getting the most out of your productivity For, yeah yeah and we need to quit that because it's not healthy uh, productivity can't. looks different every single day yeah yeah and that capitalism which is intersectional feminism is also about breaking down capitalism and finding balance in that mm -hmm. and making room for yourself and creating space to be and to relax and to you know sometimes indulge in capitalism in order to be able to destroy it mm -hmm. yeah yeah and exactly when you talk about men they usually are conditioned or they 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 get the feeling or are teach to be like the, the man of the household you mm -hmm. need to carry your family which is fine but again in the way you're getting teach to do that mm -hmm. means also that we don't learn to express our emotions or to deal with our frustrations aside from being physical or very focally towards our partners you just mentioned the figures about mm -hmm. partner partner crimes etc and, and abuse so those things are connected, like you're saying. So right. it's very, very important to notify that even men, it's not a shame if you can't provide for your family fully. We have other people in the same family or in, in, in communities who can do that for you. Right. Or maybe together. Like We're very fear of competition when it comes to women. Sexism is so normalized mm -hmm. that we actually think that it should be the women's role. Right. Or a women's role, which is very problematic yeah. and if yeah if you don't resist that thought you can't even deal with it you can't change it if you don't challenge yourself to think differently yeah how are you as a man in in this patriarchal world learning to deal with your emotions how are you, are you learning to express them uh, therapy hands down while men are at a deficit when it comes to seeking out mental health support 
they're even less likely to follow through with the recommendations of a mental health professional. What's one thing that can help men feel more comfortable accessing mental health services? Visibility. The more men like Daryl openly discuss their experiences, the more normalized it will be for others. Thanks, Daryl. I've been avoiding and neglecting all, you know, like tips and, and in, terms of advice, in terms of advice, I always avoided going to therapy because I thought it was weak. It was a sign of weakness if you have to, when you have to, well, when you're seeking help in order to deal with yourself. I thought I should be able to do, to do that by myself or I have my friends or my family or even my father back in the days to help me out. And if that isn't possible, ain't possible, yeah. I probably failed, so I thought it's, it's not about that. I mm -hmm. need to do something else. Yeah, I did two, three years ago, and it's been a blessing. It's yeah. been a painful, confronting blessing ever since. But yeah. that is so eye-opening. Mm. I recently finished seven years of seven years straight of different kinds of therapy, and it's been rough. But God, I'm so so happy I did it okay. because facing yourself like that is what you need in order to be able to grow in life. Yeah, definitely. If you don't deal with the trauma that you encountered, if you don't face it all. It's, it's going to come haunting you down. You, you cannot run away from yourself and your thoughts and your past. Exactly. You yeah. will always carry it with you. And that's something that you need to learn to accept. But that is, for some people, they're able to do it without any help. But don't be ashamed if you need that help professionally because that's what they're there for. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And there's no room for shame when it comes to toxic masculinity. There's no room for, yeah, well, maybe frustrations. But failure cannot be... An option, no, yeah, ain't, it isn't. Ain't an option. So failure and shame and other things as well. And in the process, it doesn't mean when you're in therapy, like, oh, so you're in therapy, so you're probably going to figure everything out. You press out. the button like, and now you yeah, know. Yeah. No, no. I, I could easily detect and recognize certain patterns in my head. And they're all rooted in domestic violence, I know. And probably in, in intergenerational trauma and racism as well. Right. But I do know for a fact that I made terrible mistakes as a man towards women when it when it comes to dating or cheating i've been through all of that and i at least know where it came from or where it comes from and i can't be the same person anymore not if you're out there screaming mm -hmm. that men should be doing this and that check yourself i would say that. and that's exactly what i'm trying to do and even when therapy is a bridge too far you can even or also talk with people and especially listen. Yeah. Listening is a lot of, is a thing that a lot of men should need to do. I can't say I learn it all or understand it all, but you need to listen. And I actually learned to listen by talking to women. Basically, right. my former relations. They they learn they teach me how to listen to people. And I soon realized that I usually did not do I did not listen. I just I was in a room expressing and just projecting all my fears and insecurities right. and hoping to, to, you know, be the winner of the convo. It always needs to be a winner mm -hmm. for a lot of men in a conversation like this. Yeah. But listening is something very prominent we should do. Hear, yeah. hear. Yeah. Absolutely. I feel like it's so important. And I think that if you are constantly focused on having to win the argument yeah. and wanting to come out as... Been there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Same. Totally. It is so natural to... Especially, indeed, if you grow up in a, in, in a house where domestic violence is normalized, yeah. you are constantly trying to win arguments because you're trying to have some control over anything ever. Exactly. And so, um, but letting that go and realizing that sometimes, oh, shit, I was wrong. That is, so, like, the first times are going to be so hard. Yeah. But when you, um, I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago with a friend of mine and I said something that I did not at all fact check. And she was like, no, that's not true. And I was like, probably you're right and so i just took that back and then an hour later i was like shit i i i just did that because i know that she was right and i was wrong and that was fine yeah, yeah. and that's such an eye-opener when you begin practicing that and when you begin practicing to listen and to not want to win an argument yeah, yeah yeah i've always been that way and it's actually it's it's a blessing it's it's a, a feeling of freedom when indeed when you're actually countered on something which is not right gaslighting for instance yeah I've been all that yeah like i never heard about gaslighting until i found out what it meant because of women who gave me the theory to to read and then i realized i was all that kind of person i don't want to be that person anymore I can't. right no. 
That is so important. Uh, this season, we actually have a slut show sex therapist, Sarah, uh, who adds little snippets of information to whatever we're going to say. Sarah, love. Could you add something about gaslighting? Because I feel like it's very important for you to add a bit. Gaslighting is a specific type of abuse where the abuser causes the victim to question their own sanity or reality. A gaslighter will often tell their victim they are making things up or overreacting. This eventually causes the victim to believe that they cannot rely on their own emotions or maybe even memory. The victim ultimately fears the repercussions of challenging the narrative created by the abuser. That was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, no, it is so important to like, if you don't know what gaslighting is and you don't know after Sarah's explanation, Google it, look into it and just take a step back and ask yourself, have I done this? Yeah. And if you have, go to the people you done, did it to say, I just learned what gaslighting is. I am so sorry if I ever did that to you. Apologize for things. Be the bigger person. Because that's always a good idea to be the bigger person. What do you think that um, men can do in order to contribute to feminism and make the world a safer place for women? To begin with, I think we need to acknowledge that our manhood is a culture itself. And it, a culture is disruptive. The culture is not, it's not fruitful. It is violent and it serves no purpose other than destroying things, including yourself. And I say this deliberately because, like I said, you know the hashtag, not all men, you know, like, hey, I'm a good person. Yeah, sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I of can. course you know, of course you know. <laughs> like, it's exactly about that. It, it doesn't, we are not here to prove like we're good persons. We can be, and our tensions might be good, but Stop we Stop saying yeah. not all men, oh my God. <laughs> But we are part of a bigger group. I actually share some things, even with hooligans in football stadiums. Yeah, we share our manhood, our yeah. social constructions. Being a man is something we share. Mm -hmm. So we know where it came from, where it comes from. So we need to speak the fuck up. But at least acknowledge that the patriarchy is actually a terrorist organization. I would say that. Or... I would say that we need to acknowledge that our culture, the way we are conditioned, it's not gonna help either us or women in this case. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, that would be a first big start. And we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. I saw terrible toxic masculinity when it came to the corona crisis. A lot of politicians, including Mark Rutte, mm -hmm. not trying or even thinking of, you know, like at least admit you made a mistake when it, when it came. You can't admit you made right. a mistake as a man because then you failed. So you're going to blame it. You're going to project it towards some <laughs> some others. Like the people like, well, yeah, you were the people not obeying the rules. That's why Corona spread like, you know. It is unbelievable, yeah. honestly. Yeah. I I just, I don't understand how there is, how it's possible for politicians to not, to not even admit that they were wrong about certain things. Yeah. Just yeah. say, hey, sorry, I was wrong. I'm a person too. You're a person too, exactly. We need to go that way, especially as men. And that's yeah. why I try to bring up this example because we're not good at that. We're not getting teached in order to admit we were wrong. Totally. Or, no, we're always in a competitive mode of living and acting and operating. And that is tiresome. That is, it's, it's really exhausting. And at the end of the day, yeah, you don't benefit. We think it's beneficial, but yeah. it ain't. It ain't beneficial. How do you um, tr well, how do you incorporate feminism into dating women? Because I know that you're as yeah. heterosexual as you can be, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that has been a deal breaker for for uh, for for a long time, in a sense that mm -hmm. I would say that uh, listening again to the needs and wants they have as a person is very important. Like not only defining your own rules and, and boundaries but accepting and respecting the others like hey i'm a man i know what's good for you no we're not gonna do that and in addition and that's because of Bain, i don't blame them actually i think it's very interesting yeah i started to doubt my my own sexual not preferences but in terms of monogamy i've been very not only interested but I'm, uh, i started to think like hey i've been in long-term relationships for a long time so what is this maybe this feeling i always had like i've cheated like i told you before mm -hmm. i cheated on out of insecurity frustrations 
and and other things traumas with my former relation i shouldn't be doing that i did but why why did i do that and i've been diving into like deconstructing manhood and embracing yeah different forms of getting into contact and, and right. getting engaged in relations with women and it's very interesting and that itself it's feminist because there's no room for the the narrative to be incorporated because it's all about monogamy it's all about mm-hmm. men and women men should be leaning in relationships all of that crap i don't right. have to tell you that yeah. so that would be a slide of an answer uh-huh. towards your question yeah. yeah no but i i feel like it's very good for you to share that process because i feel like there's a lot of people either beginning this process or somewhere in the middle or wherever they are in the process yeah, 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 yeah. if you're in the process you're already doing really good because mm. you you are confronting yourself with all that shit and you are like reflecting and um checking yourself and checking your behavior and that is so important yeah and um i feel like um especially like men leading having to be leaders in in dating Mm -hmm. that is something that i struggle with a lot because i know what i want i know what i like when i see it Mm -hmm. and i I ask people out because if I want to go out with someone, I'm not here to play games. Honey, I have a business to run. I don't have time for that crap. (laughs) So I'm just super honest in that regard. And um, I literally say, hey, I would like to see where things are going and stuff. Um, And if that's not where their mind is at, fine. But communication is so incredibly important in that sense. And um, being able to let someone else lead, especially if it's a woman, that says so much about your manhood. That's manhood to me mm. that's masculinity that's sexy yeah well i need i had to learn and still i'm not i'm not there yet mm-hmm. and i don't know if there is an end goal in the sense of being perfect and complete i reckon it's never the case it's, because you we're always you, a process yeah you're gonna meet new people as well but defining your own boundaries and respecting the others is something i really had to learn for yeah me. yeah and despite and actually sadly it was at the expense of emotional labor and, yeah. and the emotional state of women to begin with and this is something uh, i can't afford and you will always have maybe you have discrepancies in terms of communication right. but at least talk and be honest and i really had to learn to be honest to myself to begin with mm-hmm. in order to be honest to someone else towards someone else yeah of course yeah. speaking of emotional labor when um i this is something that i find very hard um in trying to uh, deconstruct racism Mm -hmm. and the systemic white privilege that there is going on aside from the systemic racism how um can we white people do better without like profiting off of emotional labor of black people because that is a hard one Uh, right yeah yeah To, to me i mean like there's no single answer but like you said you have to teach you have to study but especially you have to inflict you have to be able to inflict damage damage what has been done for centuries yeah you're gonna probably you're gonna get hurt by someone black people poc telling you your place in the racial debate whatever even if you have the best of intentions remember not to burden a member of an oppressed group with the responsibility of educating you on the history of their oppression in white culture it's very normal to center yourself as the main or leading figure or person when it comes to race which is very problematic but yeah in terms of sexism men women trans people cisgender people we see the same dynamic but especially as white people i think that getting yourself educated and yeah cleaning up your own backyard cleaning up your own culture would be a big massive well gain i would say so yes obviously if you don't know anything or you're doubting about certain perspectives obviously you need to talk to black people Mm -hmm. as well but maybe in a vulnerable way like hey i'm trying to learn this i'm ready to inflict upon some damage in terms of making mistakes and all of that shit but i want to learn because there's a bigger collective goal i need to achieve it's not something for me as a person but i want to represent maybe a lot of more white people in order by talking differently and yeah. ask for consent when you are approaching uh, a person of color um, yeah, if they yeah. have the headspace for that emotional labor if yeah. they can do it or yeah. if there's something that they wrote that you can read mm-hmm. ask yeah and definitely in, in, in my case it would be different in a sense that i'm a teacher i'm a youth worker right so i'm situated in a context in which people are able and they deserve to learn as well i had the privileges to learn as much as i could 
And yes, I made mistakes, but we need to transcend the notion of being afraid of making mistakes. If we can get past that, then it's it's impossible to get or to be to become a better person. Yeah. But we need to transcend that given matter that we are afraid of making mistakes. You're gonna make mistakes, but then again, if you make them, inflict upon and move on. Yeah. You cannot learn unless you fall on your face. Well, definitely, yeah. Especially in a society which has been built up like very. Well, skewed, basically. It's no, not equally. Yeah. All right. We are going to be taking a quick break from this a super interesting conversation. Um, we're going to be back to continue it. But first, can I get some backing vocals? Slut Show Sex Position Twister, your weekly dose of bedroom inspiration. Mm. The Choking Cheerleader. Perfect for introducing power play while also having a very advanced position that asks for some flexibility on the pussy owner's part. However, it does make it all real tight and it goes pretty deep, so I'd say give it a shot. Mountain climbing cunts. Ellen, you cannot write cunts, that is rude. Lovely for drowning into each other's eyes. Yeehaw! The reverse cowgirl. Fun for giving the vagina owner the power to the sight, the pace, and rhythm. Speaking of bedroom inspiration, what's your favorite position? I'm a lazy guy, actually, <laughs> in that sense. Ooh. I would say, um, I don't even know the name of the position, but if Describe I would lay it. on my back and... <laughs> In this case, a woman would ride me. I would right. be very satisfied. And usually, right. it's vice versa. So we good. Yeah. Nice, nice, yeah. cool. I'm a lazy fuck too. So okay. Mm. Yeah, wouldn't be a match. <laughs> you date women, so yeah. um, I I feel like you can learn a lot in dating because it's so it's like a whole new level of personal. Mm. Um, how do you incorporate consent in the bedroom? Well. Back in the days, I would just try to feel. A man can feel, I always say. We need to learn how to feel. I still need to, le to learn to do that. But usually it would go automatically. But then again, I learned sometimes afterwards, women were afraid to tell me stuff mm -hmm. because they thought it was like a prestige game. You need, to, right. like, you need to be on your top level or else guys would talk bad about you with their peers or whatever. Right. So I was very in shock. And then again, it's so obvious when you look at the patriarchy but because sex for a lot of guys means you have to perform mm -hmm. and you need to climax and you need to do all that stuff. Right. I really needed to learn that it is a journey. It's basically a journey in which the uh, you can you are able to control the the narrative or the the interaction. I would say right. I must say the interaction together, and not only as the man versus women, and you need to do that, and you need right. to perform. No, and try to be or try to transcend that given matter. And it's hella more fun if you do so. Totally. Yeah. 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 Yeah, se sexuality is an experience, um, and having sex with people is an experience. It's not, uh, a, like, there's no end goal to it. Well, no, no. It's like, it's a process, it's a full circle. You can uh, you can go in it and be like, okay, if we both climax and we're, we're done, uh, you can go in it and not climax and have a really good time. I used to think that sex is, um, okay, uh, a man comes and then we're done. Yeah, exactly. And I, th I thought the same. Right. Yeah. And I used to think that um, penetration is sex and the rest isn't. What? Oh, my God. It isn't? Mm -hmm. Whoa, shocker. That was, like, baffling to me. I... I have a list of bed partners. I'm very open about that mm -hmm. because I, I want to know and I want to, you know, be able to go back when I'm old and, and gray. Gingers don't get gray, by the way. Um, <laughs> details. <laughs> um, but like when I look at that list, I made it of people who I had penetrative sex with. And that's yeah. so weird because that's not it. Familiar, by the way. Yeah, right. Yeah. Familiar. Yeah. What is that like for you? Well, yeah. The process. That is uh, something which is part of deconstructing manhood as well. Mm -hmm. It's it's part of the man box. You you can you can talk about penetration and did you had sex with that woman or whatever, but you can't say, well, we just had a good time and we ended up kissing and having oral sex and that was it. If you would if I would tell my friends 
that given matter back in the days because they knew I had a date, mm-hmm. I would get laughed at. So I probably would lie and say, yeah, yeah, it was amazing and we did this and I came three times, blah, blah, blah. Right. This is how far and how deep it goes. Like yeah. the insecurities. We're, we're continuously projecting our insecurities towards each other right. in that male dominant culture. And we need to get rid of that shit. Yeah. So that was something that I tried to get rid of. Yeah, and nowadays it's different. I, we, I'm not we, but I talk more. I wanna. I'm very interested in the things women like, and mm-hmm. if you if we can talk about it prior having sex or whatever, mm-hmm. or maybe even during, yeah. that is amazing. And actually, it stimulates me to yeah to be a better person in bed as well. Yeah. Right, yeah. consent is hella sexy. Like, ask for it for fuck's sakes. Mm-hmm. I I literally had a conversation with uh, our lovely production assistant sitting next to the camera. That's why I'm, you know, looking <laughs> like that. Um, uh, about what, what kind of assholes I dated and how I, um, I I had a date with someone relatively recently, and then uh, I didn't know if it was a date because because nothing happened. And mm. I realized how fucked up it is that in my brain, if they don't at least try something, it's not a date. I'm it's like, not a date. what? Yeah. Yeah. So because I've I'm used to uh, people trying to touch me without my consent, that is so crazy. That yeah. is just so crazy. Yeah, I wouldn't say crazy because it's ableist language, but then again, yes, it is so normalized that we actually expect. That's what a lot of men will tell me still, and even boys I work with as a youth worker. Well, yeah, they asked for it because they dress that way. And if they would dress more properly according to my standard of what a woman should be, yeah, then they would, wouldn't be in trouble. Honey, is, did my dress read rape me? Didn't yeah. think so. No, no, no. So it's, so it's internalizing as well. If mm-hmm. you think that way, what you were just describing, you're so actually used, I guess, to the given matter that someone or some guy will would or is about to do something. Yeah, right. then we call it a date. Yeah, that is, I, I don't blame you because you can't, you can't help yourself for that being mm-hmm. conditioned that way. That's, this is how society works. But it's problematic, obviously. Yeah. It is problematic. Absolutely. Yeah. I, <laughs> baffling, baffling to me, truly. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even understand how, I don't know how I got to this point. I don't know how, what, what, what exactly made me think that way because it didn't used to be like that. Mm-hmm. When I grew up, I remember, you know, it was a day because I felt it. But then growing up, growing into your sexuality, hosting a slut show, people have a lot of preju- prejudices about you. People mm-hmm. think that, okay, you're the host of the slut show, so you're having sex with five guys a week and yeah. they're all different guys. Mm-hmm. Um, but that is not necessarily true. I recently didn't have sex for like six months and I'm still the host of the slut show and I still talk about sex very openly and I still have these conversations that um, need to be held. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm happy you do, really. Thank yeah. you, thank you. What are things that... Um, you right now are like I wish I could understand that better from women is there things like that hard question yeah it is a hard question indeed I'm not caught off guard Mm -hmm. but there is yeah there there is something I can understand on paper but Mm -hmm. then again I feel so because I see it in my my recent dates etc right like if I would be sleeping over because of a date mm-hmm. or whatever and i i would say like hey i forgot shit i forgot my uh, my trunks at home or whatever right usually what happens in my case because i try to listen and try to interact like i said during or after sex or prior it is like a lot of women would be like in caring mode immediately like, oh i'll we'll go to the store and get you one. Oh, do you are hungry oh i have something upstairs i will get it for you and It's not that I don't like it, but it's not my, I don't want, in terms of deconstructing manhood, it should be equally balanced, right? Uh And I think the patriarch actually, well, conditions women to be caring because it's a a way of being safe, paraphrased, you know, in in a world where males are dominant and whatever. So it's actually in my, in my imagination. I'm, I'm trying to look for questions and answers when it comes to that caring conditioned mode. Mm-hmm. Women are almost engaged in automatically. Because I, I don't say yeah. that they can't or won't or shouldn't. Yeah. But then again, I know for a fact if we try to, to deconstruct patriarchy or mm-hmm. deconstruct colonization or manhood or whatever, I do think that 
other ways of behavior in a dynamic between men and women mm-hmm. should be possible. So Absolutely. That's my, yeah, so that would be my question. What happens and how can I help in order to prevent that from happening? Um, that's a very, very good one because I catch myself doing that so often. Yeah. I am really good at taking care of people, but having people take care of me, oh, <laughs> that's a whole different story. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm. But that's also because of my past and because I... Uh, I, I I ran away from home when I was sev- just turned 17, so I've been uh, self-sufficient ever since. Mm-hmm. I've been paying my own bills, getting my own houses, um, making sure there was food on the table. So for me, caring for, uh, well, myself, but mostly people around me and yeah. making sure they are good is such, like, that's my, my second nature. That is literally what I do and what I'm super good at. And right now in my dating life, I really very proactively try and find people who... Um, are good at taking care of people yeah. so that I don't need to always do that because there is no balance if I if I'm dating with people who like being taken care of constantly. Yeah. Then I will go to that extreme. So I think it's important to you know ask uh where that comes from for that person if it's something they're comfortable with and they had a re- very relatively quote unquote easy life mm-hmm. and they like taking care of people it can be a way of showing affection it can be a way of uh showing that they care for you but it can also be very toxic. Yeah, definitely. And I try to find that balance because I know as a person, as a man, I suck (laughs) literally in in not taking care of people, but I'm easily, I'm too used to that disbalance when it comes to taking care. Yes, while dating or while being in the process of a relationship, people or women always are taking care of me and Mm -hmm. I'm used to that. I like it, but then again, like I said, when you're deconstructing your man, this is part of it as well. So that's why I'm, yeah, it's a bit of emotional labor, basically. Yeah. But Cook for them. Well, yeah. Cook for them. I hate cooking. That's something. Cook for them. Oof. Yeah, it's just, I I need to eat every day, right? In order to function. That's why I do it, but I don't like it. So I have have a lot of privileges as a man. I'm Mm -hmm. aware of that. But I'm still, before I know, into sucked and engaged into that dynamic again. Like, hey, oh, they're going to cook. Oh, great. I'm like, hold up, hold up, wait a minute. Yeah, 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 yeah. I feel like cooking for people, for me, it's a way of expressing my love for them. Mm -hmm. Um, Because, like, I've been, I cook every single day, like, twice, usually, because I am allergic to everything but the sun. And then I'm a ginger, so I'm kind of also allergic to that, you know? (laughs) Um, So, cooking is for me a very, I do it very fast and easily because I know what I can and what I can't have. Mm -hmm. So, in, in my situation, it's totally different, but I think that in general, T- go on a first date and say can i cook for you do it yeah. like men watching do it please do it take care of my girls <laughs> well yeah no definitely and there's something else which came to mind came to mind in in uh in in the example i gave mm-hmm. because dating is so heteronormative as we speak it's so conditioned that if someone would ask me or actually would tell me like hey is it okay if i would cook for you automatically in terms of quantity, I would think and, and, and tell myself, well, you need, at least you need to do something back. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's like a give and take kind of thing. And that right. is something that actually affects me as well. Like That can also be super toxic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For like, oh, she has been doing this and that already and shit. And right. well, I have only one week in order to, to, to arrange something. Is that enough? Am I enough in order to do that? Right. So a lot of insecurities as well. And then again, I do realize where it comes from uh-huh. when it comes to quantifying your marriage or your, your dynamic or your date or whatever. Yeah. It's usually quantified in who brings what to the table mm-hmm. in order to say something about it. So, Communicate, yeah. ask, yeah. have the conversation. Working on that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Good for you. I feel like this is very important. I really, really hope there is actual cis, preferably white, <laughs> men watching this because yeah. I feel like it's so important. Uh, to listen to this conversation and to uh, reflect upon your own behavior and mm-hmm. how you've been doing in the past, well, decades and uh, however long you've been on this planet. And, um, hey, shit, did you hear that? I think we have mail. Okay. We have mail. Um, so someone sent in a question saying, uh, where do I begin educating myself? Where do I begin, especially mm-hmm. as a man, about feminism? I think as a man... I would say obviously in the library there's a lot you can read and if it's not possible in terms of you know money or Mm -hmm. maybe ability when you have a 
you know, like a disability or whatever, that's something else. But right. it, it begins with reading, reading and trying to to get to lecture on behalf of people who do not look like you, who think differently, who right. have an opinion about something which is very normal to you in terms of privileges. That would yeah. be my main answer. And yes, you have to get into communities of people who actually paved the way for you as a man to begin with in Absolutely. order to prevent emotional labor talk to men and they are around or surf the internet check out your networks in which you probably can find them yeah. share the slut show with your friends <laughs> yeah definitely will do that yeah thank you so much for being here i really Pleasure. enjoyed this conversation i feel like it can be very beneficial for a lot of different people right now um thank you at home for tuning in for this week's episode next week i will be back same place same time and then you will see this I was having sex on the couch while they were like in the other rooms sleeping. <laughs> These people forget that it's so much fun to be sexually active. Yeah. It's a legitimate hobby. <laughs> yeah. I, that which I know is like five bed partners is like high. Oh, honey. What? <laughs> I had five in one night? Like, what? And I realized I'm a slut. <laughs> Maybe men like collectively just need therapy. For at least yeah. three years That's and you know good. face themselves face their own misogyny face their own patriarchal bullshit see you are a psychologist <laughs> i will collect the fucked up men i will just send you the list of people i had sex with <laughs> i did not just say that and then i was like oh i should get a vibrator so much fun haha <laughs> so i got a vibrator but it was without a base on the end i think i tried it too much and it disappeared <laughs> <laughs> if you want to read the information from Slutty Science again, please head over to theslutshow.org. Yes, orgasm. Theslutshow.org, where you are now also able to get your hands on my five-piece postcard collection. Oh my god. Dedicated to destroying the patriarchy and empowering you. Uh, so get your hands on it. Uh, if you'd like to support The Slut Show in another way, you can support me on Patreon by buying me a coffee, which is only four euros a month, or you can donate once, which would already, already be fantastic, and support both me and the team behind the camera tremendously. Please follow me on Instagram and obviously follow Daryl. I will plug all the social media details in the description box. Send in your questions to the Instagram of The Slut Show, at The Slut Show with Alan Moore, and we will be answering them on the show. How cool is that? Do it. <laughs> Don't forget to give the video a big thumbs up, subscribe to my YouTube channel, share The Slut Show with your friends. Thank you at home for uh, watching. Thank you for being here. And for now, Sluts, sluts out. out. <laughs>